Okay. So it's nearly time for our next introduction. I just had a lovely chat uh, with them. So this time I'm going to introduce Sui Kiat Lim. He's co-founder and CEO of Pebbly. And we had a nice chat. And I have a fun fact about this next speaker. They actually worked as a makeup artist in a past life. So if you have any makeup questions, <laughs> I think this was also the reason what led him down this very visual path. His talk is going to be about generative AI, specifically about image generative AI, and the resources needed to kind of power these kinds of tools. So yes, give it up for our next speaker. Thank you very much. Hello, Tess, can everyone hear me? Hi, yes, okay. Um, so I'm SK for short, and I'm, like I mentioned, co-founder and CEO of a company called Pebbly, where we're using AI image generation and getting that to power a lot of real-world applications. And so, you know, whenever I'm on stage, I kind of feel the need to sell a little bit of my company, so I'm just gonna do that for like two minutes, if you can bear with me about that. So what Pebbly does, um, our first app was actually for product photography. What we can do is use this for e-commerce businesses. They will just upload a photo of their product that they can take with their phone, with their camera, and then our app removes the background and uses AI image generation to generate all of these really nice backgrounds that you see there. And the cool part is that our pipeline can accurately reproduce the lighting, the shadows, and the reflections that you see. So all of this on the right-hand side are generated from a single image on the left. And so this was launched in January this year. And so today, nine months later, we have had over a million signups. We've generated millions of images for tons of e-commerce businesses all over the world. But there was always something when we were building this um, that was missing. So because we're only replacing the background, we can't change what's on the product. So you, we, we can't like squish the product. We can't draw things on the product. We can't fold it. And that's fine for a lot of products like jewelry, cosmetics, um, and like bottles and things like that. But it's a disaster for fashion. So early on, um, funny story, we had this user who was selling t-shirts and they would take, um, lay, take their t-shirt, lay it on their bed, and take a photo of that, upload it to our app, and try to get the t-shirt to be on a human model. So they would type stuff like um, t-shirt on a human model and all our pipeline was generating was just like random like floors and, and walls and things like that. And so they got really frustrated. They sent like tons of complaint emails and we just refunded them. But it was always something that was bugging us. We wanted to be able to apply the same technology to the fashion industry. And we thought that it would be really cool. There would be a huge opportunity there. So we've been working on it for a couple of months. And most recently, we've been able to create a pipeline that can accurately walk t-shirts and see how it folds on to human models. So given an image of a flat t-shirt that you see on the top left, all of the images that you see on the right are generated. None of the human models exist. None of the backgrounds here exist. And we're working with a couple of different fashion companies to roll this out, possibly augmenting for the model photo shoots. And we think there's some really cool technology that might change the modeling industry. So that's it for my less than two minute rant about my promotion of my company. Just gonna go into the real topic that we're about today. And that's um, the open source movement that's powering image generation. So at Pebbly, a lot of what we're doing has been inspired by what we've been seeing in, image, uh, in the open source space. So I'm just gonna take like, uh, this time to give a really brief tour of all of the different cool projects. And um, there'll be a lot of resources, a lot of different projects that you'll be seeing, so feel free to take any pictures, and um, yeah. So let's start with Stable Diffusion. So Stability AI released this image model called Stable Diffusion late last year in August, slightly over a year ago, and it was the very first time that there was a public release of a large latent diffusion model that could generate images as good as closed source models like those being used by Midjourney. And because the training script for this and the model weights were totally publicly released, this means that anyone can just take this, download it, run it on their laptop if your laptop is powerful enough, run it on your computer, you could take the training script, fine-tune it on your own data set, and create a whole new model just on your images. 
So this really started that whole open source movement around image generation with latent diffusion models. So one of the early things that got created was a way to interact with this model very easily. So an open source app that was released very early on, actually on the same day of the public release, was this app called Automatic 1111. You can go like to, you can search this on Google, you can download it, it's an open source app. The UI isn't too nice, but it works. You can download it onto a computer and you can generate images with it. And a lot of people are using it to create a lot of really, really nice images. I'll show you a couple of them later. The other nice thing about releasing a model open source like what Stability AI did is that you will have a lot of research institutions um, and like universities building their research on top of what they've released because they can access it. So one such example is DreamBooth. DreamBooth is actually a uh, work that's been published by some Google authors. And in their paper, they described it as working on ImageGen, which is their proprietary image generation model. But because Stable Diffusion was open source, they also tried it out on Stable Diffusion and it works. So what DreamBooth is, it is a special, special way of fine tuning a model. What you can do is you can give it a couple of input images of a certain subject. So in this case, of a corgi puppy, right? And after fine tuning the model on that using the DreamBooth method, your fine tuned model can now generate the same puppy, but now in different positions that are unseen in the original data set. And you don't need that many data set, uh, that many images at the beginning to, be, to start with. But you can generate this new corgi puppy in all sorts of different positions, doing different things with different backgrounds. And like I mentioned, because the training script was released and the model weights were released, people started training a ton of their own models. And there was a need for a space for us to share these models with each other, for us to store and upload these models. So two months later after the release of Stable Diffusion, Civit AI was created. And to this day, it is still a free public repository. And it contains thousands of different Stable Diffusion related models as well as resources uh, related to Stable Diffusion. I would have to caution at this point for anyone who's assessing this is uh, with any image generation technology, there are a lot of not safe for work use cases there. So when you're entering that, just be careful and like um, learn what to filter out you know, when you're assessing this website. But it does contain a lot of very rich resources around training models and different like stable diffusion related models. The other thing that emerged around December last year uh, was this GitHub user called Clone of Simo. He took this, uh, he applied this technique called LoRa, a low rank adaptation to stable diffusion. So just a quick overview of what LoRa is. Um, earlier, one of the speakers, Victoria, she mentioned about large language models and how we can fine tune this on data sets. When we train a large language model on a special data set to make it more specialized to a certain task, Originally, this might take a lot of time because these large language models are huge, right? They can be hundreds of gigabytes. And you will need a lot of resources to train the entire model. So that's one. The other problem is that once you train something like this, how do you share it with someone? I'm going to send you a 200 gigabyte file over email. That's not going to work. So as a response to these problems with large language models, researchers at Microsoft invented this low rank adaptation method that essentially allows you to fine tune a large model with just a small number of weights. And these small number of weights, called LoRa weights, they are um, essentially modular. So what this means is that you can change out the different LoRa's and the model can now do different things with different LoRa's. The other cool thing is that uh, LoRa's are really small. So instead of gigabytes in size, they can be just megabytes in size. But uh, what they can do is that they are still really, really cool, really, really good after being fine tuned. And now instead of sending you a 100 gigabyte file, I'll just send you this small couple of megabyte LoRa model. So what Clone of Simo did is it, he realized that this same model can be applied to this same technique, can be applied to stable diffusion. And it just made sharing of fine tuned models so much easier when you're sharing megabytes instead of gigabytes. So if you actually go into Civit AI today, what you're actually going to see is a lot of different LoRa models. So you see all this here on the top left, there'll be that LoRa word. So all of these are actually LoRa models that are fine-tuned 
and they are much smaller than the original stable diffusion or stable diffusion XL models. Then early this year in January, um, one of my favorite uh, UIs got invented. So a user called Comfy Anonymous, he was just fiddling around with stable diffusion. He wanted to understand it better. So he created his own app about um, how to, a new UI to interact with stable diffusion. And the cool thing is that this new UI is node-based. What that means is that we break down the whole image generation pipeline into different components. So you see here all the different components that are connected by these wired connections. And this really helps you understand the, the pipeline for stable diffusion image generation. But in addition to that, the side effect is that we can switch out different components. And we can also build custom components for custom use cases. I think that this is just a really cool demonstration of just the open source community at work. Some engineer, hobbyist, was just doing this in his own free time because he wanted to understand how stable diffusion works. And then he, he created this really nice UI and he released it and everybody started contributing to it. And today there are like tons of extensions for Comfy UI. The other really cool work that got released uh, in February this year by a bunch of Stanford researchers is this thing called ControlNet. So at the beginning with stable diffusion, or if anyone who has tried mid-journey, you know that you can enter, type some text, and then you get an image of what you've described. With ControlNet, in addition to text, the stable diffusion model can now take in images. So let's say you're really bad at drawing, right? And you draw this rubbish image of a tortoise. You can feed that into stable diffusion, and stable diffusion uses your lousy sketch and generates a really nice image of a real life tortoise or for a room for that matter. The other cool thing that you can do is you can take stick figures of humans and generate images of people in the same pose. The other thing on the bottom right is what we call a depth map. So the depth map essentially shows the depth of the particular image where the white regions are nearer to the camera, the dark regions are further away. Stable diffusion, the control net allows stable diffusion to take in a depth map and generate images that correspond to the depth map. So at this point, all of this is all open source. And another really cool thing that I think underlies what ControlNet has done with Pose, the human Pose one, is all the work that has been done in Pose detection. Pose detection is a really complicated thing. We need to train, design a special neural network to do Pose detection. And then we need a labeled data set that is huge. And the labeled data set is not just pictures of people, right? You need someone to go in there and draw lines about like, where everyone's arm is, where their legs are, where their torso is. You need this giant label data set. And researchers have trained models on this and they have released it fully open source for everyone. There are three um, papers here actually, open post, RDM post, DW post. All of them are open source. DW post is the most recent one and actually has really, really good results around face, facial feature detection as well as um, finger detection. So that actually helps a lot with stable diffusion's generation of images with fingers. It's still not quite perfect, but with DW Pose, you can actually get really good results for fingers. Um, so you actually get five fingers when you generate an image in stable diffusion with DW Pose's control net instead of like 10 fingers on one hand or something like that. Now, the other really cool thing about control net is that beyond just giving stick figures or line drawings, somebody discovered that you can pass in, you can train a control net on QR codes. So what you see here is actually a QR code that actually works. You can scan it, and I've taken, um, you know, I've, I've shared this here. If you scan it, it goes to the, the, the website of the creator who came up with this technique. Let me know if it works. Does it work? You know, you can nod if it works. Oh, oh, <laughs> sorry for that. <laughs> Does it work? It works? Okay, great, great. Okay, so. So this works, and this is crazy, right? I mean, look at this. This is like a work of art, um, and, 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 it, and it scans. And um, so the, the, the person who created this, if you scan this, you'll go to his website. Uh, I think it's a paid service, so I'm not too sure about you know, whether you want to do that. But the cool thing is that um, so when, when whoever released this, they didn't describe how they did it. But then the open source community rallied, and then they were like, we want to figure out how to do this. And, and we actually discovered certain pipelines that kind of do, the, do similar stuff. 
So what you see next here is actually something that I created last night just for this talk. Um, if you scan this, it goes to my company's website. So you can, can give that a try. Um, it's actually meant to replicate like Dubai Skyline, but that didn't quite work. Um, but again, um, this is a QR code that should kind of work. Does it work? I'm not too sure. It works? OK, good. Thank you. So, so yeah, I think with, with control, and again, we've discovered like, you know, this open source library that actually allows you to create things like this. Um, all of this is free to download for anyone with an internet connection. So I think that's just super cool. <coughs> I can see still people still scanning. Anyone still scanning? Yes. I mean, this is for my company, so I can leave it up there for a while. Um. <laughs> yes. <laughs> OK, the other thing we can do with the same model is that instead of passing in QR codes, we can pass in company logos. So you can imagine we can start like incepting people's minds with like logos of like big companies like Nike, like Twitter, like McDonald's. Um, I mean, this is just a kind of a fun thing that went viral in the open source community. But we can also see that there can be really real world applications for this in marketing and advertisements and commercials. So yeah, I mean, all of this again, completely open source. The other thing uh, more recently that came up in the open source community was this thing called Animate Diff. So Animate Diff is a module that you can plug into Stable Diffusion again. And it allows Stable Diffusion to now generate frames that when combined together turns into a GIF or a video. What you're seeing here is actually the version 2 of Animate Diff that's just been released a month ago. And it's really, you know, the quality is really pretty decent. And we're actually starting internally in Pebbly to see how we can apply this to generate product advertisements, product reels for like TikTok, Instagram reels, and things like that. Again, the weights for this is downloadable. Search Animate Diff, and you can find it on GitHub, and you can actually run it. I can run this on my laptop. And yeah, I think that's just super cool. Now, finally, the most recent one I'm going to share out of all the open source stuff that has turned up uh, in the past year is this work called Image Prompt Adapter or IP Adapter. It's by a lab from Tencent. It's just published in August this year. So again, going back to the control net example, previously we could only supply text to stable diffusion to generate images. And then with control net, we can give like outlines and, and stick figures. With IP Adapter, what we can do is we can provide an image, and stable diffusion will use that to style new images that are created. So in the first example that you see above, we provide IP adapter with a BIB adapter, the, this image of a female knight wearing armor with red hair. Stable diffusion takes that and creates more images that look similar, of a similar vibe. We can combine this with a text prompt. So given that image of a statue on the bottom left, combining that with wearing a hat on the beach, you get the same statue or something similar wearing a hat on the beach. Here are more examples. We can combine that with a photo of someone and impaint that into an existing image. We can use IP adapter to combine two images and generate images that are a combination of the two. We can combine IP adapters with control net. So the depth control net that I mentioned earlier, you combine the IP adapter with that, you generate um, images that are corresponding to both the control net and the IP adapter. So that's sort of an overview of a lot of cool stuff in the stable diffusion world and the image generation world. And I think just, I just wanted to bring your attention to this cool memo that got leaked. Um, it was written by a Google employee. And uh, so I, I was previously working at Google, right? And internally in Google, uh, a lot of employees will write things and they'll publish them internally and, and anyone in Google can access them. So one of these memos got leaked to the public and the title was We Have No Mode and Neither Does OpenAI. The gist of this article was about how open source work is actually moving really, really quickly and it can even have the potential to outpace research that's actually being done by big companies like Google, like Meta, like Amazon. If you search this up on the internet, you're going to find the article, you're going to find comments about the article, people agreeing, people disagreeing. Um, DeepMind's CEO actually disagrees with this. He, he thinks that Google's team 
can definitely do better than an open source community. Um, but for me, I think what's interesting is that the article even appeared in the first place that people are actually arguing about this. The fact that an open source community whose resources are available for free for everyone, publicly, publicly available, is even remotely comparable to the research that's being done by tech companies investing millions of dollars into their researchers. I think that's just something super cool. And as companies, whether you're a startup or just like another company that's doing that's in the tech space, you're interested in AI, I think it's just important to keep note, to take note of this open source movement. There's a lot of really cool projects out there. And there are some really important things to keep in mind. So for the last part of this talk, I'm just gonna go over like some of the takeaways and thoughts that I have about all of this cool stuff that's been going on. Now, first of all, I think we need to recognize that the open source movement serves a very niche community. Uh, for those of us here who are like hackers, who are engineers, software engineers, who love coding in their spare time, just building random site projects, open source is a very attractive proposition. It represents a lot of cool projects that we want to work on. But that's the niche group that we're, we're, we're talking about. Now, look at like, the interfaces that I'm showing here. right? So there's Automatic 11.11, and there's Comfy UI, both of which can be used to uh, access stable diffusion. The thing is that I'm not going to give this to my parents and get them to try out image generation on their laptop, because they're not going to be able to understand how to use this. It's a little bit too complicated. And you kind of need a certain level of technical know-how. You need a user guide. You need to read through some documentation to install this and to use it. So this actually represents a really huge opportunity for companies to come in and provide user-friendly alternatives of these apps that can access a large larger, much larger population and cater a large, much larger market. The other thing is that it's important to realize that it can be a little bit hard to beat open source. So take this image, for example. This image is fully generated on a consumer setup um, using, oh, I think it's cut out a little bit there, but it's actually called the Realism Engine SDXL model. So the SDXL model is the most recent stable diffusion model. It stands for Stable Diffusion Extra Large, I think, um, by Stability AI. And on top of that, somebody took that huge model and fine-tuned it on their own data set and created what they call Realism Engine SDXL. And this is a, an image generated by that. I mean, look at this picture, right? It's, it's really realistic. I think it's incredible that a laptop can generate this with free code that I can download from the internet. So on that note, I think for small teams, it, you need to be mindful about the availability of all of this. Take a close look at all the open source models that are out there, all the off-the-shelf models, before you actually decide that, oh, you know what, I want to retrain my own model. I want to rebuild this infra. Because there could be already something out there that outperforms anything that you can imagine. The other thing is, let's say you do decide to build like your own pipeline. I think that you need to be clear about what part of your pipeline is proprietary to your company, what, what gives you an edge and what can actually be replaced by some open source components. And for the parts that can be replaced, you should build these so that they are compatible. You should build your pipeline so that they're compatible with open source components in the event that down the, down the road, a week later, a month later, a new open source library comes up that's better, you can immediately swap that out. So this is just something to be mindful about as small teams. Open source moves fast, as what we have seen. You know, just in the past year, you have seen all of these projects. So I think it's important to keep an eye on this, and it can be difficult to, to know where to look. So I've just highlighted some examples here. So the top two are, are subreddits. Um, the first is about stable diffusion. The second is with Comfy UI, um, the app that I shared. Um, Beno Doko is actually a Discord group. Um, you can try searching for this. I'm actually not sure whether you can find it. But it's a Discord group that's actually working really actively on Animate Diff. They're super excited about this. All of them are working there for like free. It's their, their hobby, but they're training models on text to video generation. They're inventing a lot of cool new workflows and things um, about video generation. So if you get a chance, check that out. 
And then finally, the last three usernames that you see there, they're just YouTube channels. Um, I think they really create really good content. Um, and I think the cool thing about these three YouTube channels is they share a lot of um, cool stuff related to open source work. So check those out. And um, they have a lot of tutorials and guides. And the related to my last point, when you are allocating resources in your engineering team, I think it's just important to consider the question that I have here. Is it better to build something yourself, or should you just wait a couple of weeks for someone else in the open source community to release it? Knowing the answer to this question requires an understanding of the open source community. What projects are likely to be picked up by enthusiastic developers? What projects are, are nearing completion? What requires just a little bit of work by open source developers um, who are interested in this? And what might they never ever touch, right? So if it's an important problem to you, but it's something that is unlikely to be solved by an open source developer, then this is something you would definitely want to build in-house. But otherwise, maybe you could just wait a couple of weeks for someone else to release something open source. So finally, I just want to share a little bit of my thoughts about what's next. Over at Pebbly, we're really excited about all the video generation technology that's been emerging. So we're keeping a really close eye on that. I actually believe that video generation at this point is similar to where image generation is just last year. So we're going to see, I think, um, a lot of rapid work being done here soon. In addition to that, because video generation is emerging, I think that there is actually an opportunity here for a whole new interface that is different from image generation. With image generation, like you know, mid-journey, you type in something, you get an image. With video generation, I kind of feel like that's not enough because there is a time dimension to it. It would be nice if you could have a timeline in the app, have people insert keyframes that they want to have to see in a video. In addition to that, video generation still takes quite a bit longer because you're generating all the different frames. So we need some way of handling that. Maybe there's a new UI that we can think about to solve that problem compared to image generation. But yeah, there's something that I'm super interested in as well. And I think that's the end of my talk. Yeah. So I think that's the end of my talk. Um, the QR code links to my LinkedIn if you're interested. And um, if you're interested in product photography, in fashion modeling, in image generation, video generation, feel free to connect. Um, or I think after this talk, I'll be around. And just like drop me a message, tap me on the shoulder. Um, I also have a workshop that's happening in, I think, an hour's time or something like that. I can't remember exactly um, over there. I think the other corner of this hall. So check that out um, if you have the time. But yeah, I think that's pretty much it. I actually have four minutes. Do we want to take questions? Hi. Oh, there we go. Oh. Yes, you beat me to it. Also, I forgive you for not mentioning my YouTube channel. It's okay. It's fine. You're forgiven. Um, okay. So basically, do we have any questions? I'm sure you have a lot. This is a really interesting topic. Yes, I think this gentleman was first. Do you want to take the mic? Okay. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. One question. So. Once I have the open source, how to take it up with the use case if I, I need to integrate with API, existing API, how do I do the migration? Like what is the good tools that I can use it if I'm not a not, not tech uh, guy? Right, you mean like if you're not too familiar with like the tech behind yes. it? Yes. A little bit hard. Okay. <laughs> okay, so at, at Pebbly, um, uh, so I do a lot of the technical work in, in Pebbly. And what we would typically do when we see an open source library that, 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 that seems really cool, we have a cool use case for that. I think first of all, we build an offline prototype. Okay. Right? So, so usually we might have a, a, a user in mind who can use that already. Mm -hmm. So let's say we have like some cool new fashion thing, fashion video production uh, project. And we have somebody who's interested in that. I will, down, I will use this open source stuff, build something on my laptop, it doesn't have to be online yet. Okay. And let's just show this to my client, right? Check it out, see that reaction. 
you know, are they like, do their eyes open widely or do they like, like, okay, just look at this and like, what was this? Like protect um, and, Yeah, so maybe do some yeah. testing about that. And I think regarding to deployment, that is actually a key piece of engineering that I think um, you do need ex expertise there. Okay. Because even with Pebbly, as we scale from hundreds of users to million users today, um, there were times when our servers went down because, you know, I'm not great at the back end. So, we, you know, we, we have to hire um, people to come in um, and build up this back end stuff that cannot just be taken off the shelf from a lot of this open source stuff. So, I do think you still need engineers for that, yeah. So, what is the foundation model for this? Um, so, for this, it's, it's called stable diffusion. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I see. So, you, and then you um, combine it with painting and uh, going forward, yes. right? Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Amazing, thank you for that. And yes, we have another question here. Right, great. So uh, I just wanted to clarify something you mentioned earlier. Uh, what exactly do you mean by open source compatibility? Like for somebody who's creating, say, a chatbot maybe. So yeah, how right. do you define it? Okay, so it can mean many things. I think the gist of it, so I'll, I'll give like the overview. Uh, so the question was, what, what, what did I mean by designing for open source compatibility? I'm going to give like an overview of it and then a specific example. So the whole idea is being modular and you know as a startup when I'm presenting to investors then a lot of them will be like um, this open source thing is moving very quickly right how are you going to compete and, and are you worried are you stressed and honestly we are because everything is moving very quickly but I think the important thing is that once your tech pipeline is modular when you see something new that comes up, what should appear in your head should be that this is an opportunity for you to make your pipeline even better. What I mean by open source compatibility is engineering your pipeline so that it becomes easy for me to take that and plug it in with minimal engineering work. I don't have to change the code for my entire code base in order to use the new development. So here's a concrete example. Going back to like the post detection, right? So um, the post detection is basically that stick figure thing where um, you have an algorithm that detects all the key points in your body. And a lot of open source libraries, they use a, a common um, way to, de to denote what are the key points. And in that case, you know, you should probably use the same format. Don't invent your own format when you're doing that because if you do, then you're going to have to retrain all of these models to fit that new format. But if you use the format that you know, some of the open source community agrees on, then you could just plug in the new model and replace it without changing anything in the rest of your code. I mean, that's, that's a simple example. You know, th there are some specific circumstances in other examples, but I, I think that gives an overview. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for your question. Is there one more? I, no? Maybe it's your oh. hand. One more? Ah, over there, yes, perfect. Hello, uh, thank you for the talk and for uh, sharing the resources. Yeah. Uh, I actually have uh, one question regarding uh, gener generative AI and in general. Um, uh, and for, your, for, for the company or public specific, and as you mentioned that uh, one customer was trying to um, make a t-shirt on, mm -hmm. on a human model and then he was not satisfied, then you yeah. had to refund them, okay? Yeah. So uh, th this, is, this is exactly my question. I mean, how do you measure like uh, first uh, like uh, customer, like I don't want to say it's satisfaction, but uh, if they're getting the value from the product, okay? Um, uh, like in terms of like if you're doing like normal software development then you have like the unit testing and then you'll put all the use cases and then uh, okay I w if I feed this input I will get this, that output and uh, and that's it but for generative AI how can you uh, ensure like your product is working as intended right. and if the users are like uh, getting the, the correct output right and okay um Okay, I think first of all, I think we're, we're out of time, so that'll be the last question I'll be taking, but if anyone has any other questions, happy to take that after, you know, when I, when I head down. Um, so to that question, I think the question was more about with image generation like you see here, there is a lot of randomness involved. What you're generating, you can't always do unit testing on it. Um, okay, what you can kind of do is you can, so every image generation run, 
you can define a what we call a random seed or a random number generator, right? An RNG. And given the same seed, you can always get the same result. But the problem is that when we're deploying this in production, users, they want to see different images. You can't use the same seed. You know, the whole point of generative AI here is, is, is that it's creative. It creates results that surprises people. The unfortunate downside of that is that sometimes the surprises are not nice surprises. They are bad surprises. You, know, um, you generate people that have, I don't know, like one eye or, or like five, six fingers on one hand, and that's horrible. Um, here's the thing. Uh, I think that we are really early in this space. I think that actually is a huge opportunity because we are actually looking internally at how do we evaluate these models. If I train two different models, how do I know one is better than the other? I think that, that is what you're trying to get at, right? Um, there are a few different metrics that we're looking at internally. So at Pebbly, what we do is when a user types in, my, my, my yellow serum bottle is next to flowers. There should be flowers appearing in the picture. So what we can do, one, one metric that we can do actually is we use a machine learning model to actually um, detect if flowers appear in the image given a particular prompt. So that's one. Um, the other thing is that there is this thing we call an FID score uh, that, that can assess how realistic an image is. So if an image has a very low FID score, or if a set of images have lower FID score compared to another set of images, then the lower FID score one would be technically of a lower quality. They don't look as good. So there are some metrics that we're using, but I'll be very honest. Um, as a startup in this space, a lot of times we are dealing with a lot of uncertainty. So real story, um, we actually just rolled out a pipeline uh, a month ago that is supposed to give better images. And like 80% of the time it does. But then we started getting emails from people who will be like, this new model sucks, right? And, and because they are in the 20%, and then the question is, and then the, the 80% who are seeing better images, they're not going to email you and tell you that, you know, your images are better. They're not going to do that. They're going to keep quiet because they're getting good images, right? Um, so, so this is still something that honestly we wrangle a lot with. I don't have a really good answer to that. Um, a lot of it is just trying it, saying sorry to your users, um, and, and managing, you know, user expectations that way. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Otherwise, um, yeah, I think that's all. And thank you for having me on the stage. Amazing round of applause, please. And if you have any questions, please make sure to yeah, give a tap on the shoulder as our speaker just said.